the apartment building behind the farm shop. I can't think of the name. Uh, 60 oh, seconds, guys. I know the building. 60 seconds. If we could mute, if you could mute, guys, 60 seconds. Guys. 22 That's Kenyon Street. 22, yep. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining tonight's Health and Human Service Committee meeting on uh, Monday, March 1st, 2021. Uh, we are being broadcast live on Channel 96 on Comcast and Frontier stations. It would also be streamed via HPATV.org, the HPATV Facebook page, and HPATV's Roco TV, Apple TV, and Amazon TV apps. It will also be broadcast on HPA TV outlets and made available on the HPA TV YouTube channel. Thank you. It looks like we're expanding our broadcast. So that's great. So tonight we have uh, Councilwoman, uh, uh, voting member, Councilwoman Mar Marilyn Rosetti, voting member, Councilman John Gale, uh, Director Arroyo uh, from Health and Human Services, and Damar Osborne for uh, Corporation Council. So thank you all for attending tonight. I'm appreciative of um, everyone attending on this Monday, the March 1st, can you believe it? We're already into March 1st. So we're gonna move the agenda items around in terms of uh, postponing. Uh, so uh, we are going to postpone uh, item number four, which is a resolution requesting that the Mayor's office provide more consistent administrative support uh, dedicated to translation services for Hartford's Puerto Rican, Latin, and Hispanic communities. We are also going to postpone a uh, uh, resolution requesting that the Court of County Council calls our representatives from the Hartford Public Library and the Mayor's office to provide an update on progress of this taxpayer funded initiative and that the city's Office of Community Engagement provide a biannual report to the Court of Common Council on its efforts to engage, inform, educate Hartford's refugee and immigrant families. Uh, so we're gonna postpone that. Uh, I'll make a, uh, can someone make a motion? So moved. Second. So, uh, so moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Both items have been postponed. Thank you. All right, so both items have been postponed. We are going to um, go to item number two, which is uh, the ordinance, uh, the tobacco ordinance. Uh, Article 4, Section 102, introduced by uh, Councilman Gale and uh, Majority Leader Clark. Uh, Councilman Gale, you have the floor. So I, it's, <clears throat> I guess it's a little unfortunate that um, Majority Leader is not here uh, to comment on this. Obviously, this has generated a tremendous amount of um, uh, public uh, interest, public comment, public opposition. There's also been a, a tremendous amount of public support. And one of the very unfortunate things that occurred uh, was that when we had the public hearing uh, two weeks ago, uh, we did not follow the uh, traditional council rules, which call for you to have somebody speaking in opposition and somebody speaking in favor. And then you're, you alternate back and forth. And instead, and this is you know clearly COVID related. I'm just not, I'm not, um, uh, you know, I'm not uh, suggesting there's anything improper. But because instead the chair simply took people in order, and the people who uh, you know had filled in the early part of the uh, you know got there first, so to speak, were all the people who were in opposition. I'm told there was a substantial number of people who were in favor, uh, who just did not get a chance to uh, to speak. I was contacted subsequent to the public hearing by um, 
uh, some of the uh, nonprofit organizations that are, are really the, the leaders behind this, the American Heart Association uh, being chief among them, and uh, had had discussion with those folks. They, they uh, have s suggested an amendment uh, to the ordinance, which I think could be determined to be substantive that could cause it to go back for another public hearing. But what I said when I talked to these folks was I really needed to know where Councilman Clark was uh, on this. Uh, uh, he and I have jointly uh, proposed it and um, uh, you know I want to make sure that uh, we're in agreement and moving forward with it uh, uh, if we're if we're going to move forward with it uh, I I think it's um, it, it would act you know it would, it would clearly demonstrate tremendous leadership on the part of the city of Hartford uh, we heard an awful lot of uh, uh, concern from our convenience store operators uh, that this was going to affect their uh, their bottom lines, and certainly one of the things that I had indicated uh, to uh, anybody who contacted me, and and will indicate here, uh, is part of the reason for the, for us taking the lead on this is that this, the city of Hartford, as well as um, uh, Bridgeport, which is also considering this. We have the ability to help the state move uh, in this direction, and part of the part of the goal in introducing this is to really get the state of Connecticut to adopt a very similar uh, a very similar uh, position. And I would be prepared certainly to take a second look at this if the state of Connecticut did not adopt the similar position. And therefore, I would be prepared to say that the um, uh, the ordinance in Hartford, when adopted, would not go into effect. We would adopt it, but it wouldn't go into effect for you know some period into 2022. Both giving the operators of uh, stores, people who sell merchandise, plenty of time to get rid of their inventory, but more importantly, giving the state of Connecticut time to act on this very important piece of legislation. If the state did not act, I would not necessarily be in favor of putting our uh, our retailers at a disadvantage to a retailer that's you know across the border in Weathersfield or West Hartford or Windsor or East Hartford. Uh, I'm uh, uh, you know if they're all in the same boat with everybody in Connecticut, then that's the way it is, um, and that's really where I would want to be on this. Uh, so I just wanted to share those comments. Having said that, because uh, I, I'm not sure where where we are with this. I I guess uh, I'd be happy to listen to other comments tonight, uh, but I'd also be happy to simply postpone this on this agenda and keep it here while we, uh, you know, while we see uh, if Councilman Clark is going to be willing to support uh, the amendment. And the amendment, by the way, is designed um, to make it clear to the to uh, the public, clear to the to the retailers, clear to everybody, that violation of this ordinance is not a criminal uh, penalty. There, there's, I mean, you know, we heard some comments about you're going to be criminalizing uh, walking down the street with a Newport cigarette, and that's clearly not the case. Uh, and so the language was the, the language that was proposed to to go into this amendment would be designed to make sure that everyone knows. Um, uh, that this is just a regulatory measure like every other regulatory measure. We don't have our police department hanging outside of convenience stores waiting to snatch somebody who sells to somebody under 21. Um, but but they all know what the rules are, and this would be another regulatory uh, another regulatory rule. So I, until I really know if that if we're going to adopt that amendment, I guess I would ask uh, again. I'd be happy to listen to any comment or or answer any questions anyone has, but otherwise I would be also be happy to simply uh, postpone this on this agenda. Any comments or discussion? Well, I mean, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I think to your point, Councilman Gale, um, without Majority Leader Clark here and and uh, me being at the disadvantage, uh, having a, a family issue and not being on the um, public hearing that night, I do um, understand 
uh, certainly the health piece, but I also understand the concern of if you're, you know, a convenience store right on the line to Weathersfield, you know, at this point in recovery from, uh, you know, economically from the pandemic, it's probably not the wisest time to do that. But the bigger thing is that we don't have the other proponent of the um, resolution, you know, of the ordinance here with us. So I would, I would prefer to, you know, postpone it or whatever is appropriate. That's my comment. So um, any other discussion? I don't know if anyone else wants to uh, come in here. Um, so I have a couple comments on this. Um, so I think that um, the spirit of this um, of this uh, resolution, um, you know, is I think we all can agree with, you know, and that no one wants children to engage in things that are going to be harmful for them. That's number one. I, you know, um, so we definitely heard uh, uh, proponents for this resolution in that regard. And I want to thank everyone also for sending me all of their, um, you know, stories and narratives. And I read them all. I just want to just tell the community that I read, it, I read them all. And, uh, and speaking to a lot of um, folks that were proponents of this, um, you know, thank you for sharing your stories and the addiction and the science. And, um, you know, there is a measured voice. On the other end, on this item, there has been much consternation and going back and forth from neighborhood businesses um, from uh, statewide elected officials, from folks, opponents of this, indicating how crippling this would actually be to Hartford. And, um, and I also want to thank you for your stories. And I also want to thank you for um, sharing, you know, the plights that you're going through, not just about this resolution, but also about the items regarding, you know, the pandemic and how things have affected it. And I, too, have read all of um, everyone's comments. I, I've tried to reach back to everyone, you know. And the other thing that I'm thankful for is how engaged, you know, the community was. You know, when we, when we have these items like this, I really get excited about folks chiming in, listening, really having a pulse on what's going on. Um, but here's my concerns about the resolution. I think the first piece is, is that, um, what what are we trying, I mean, what are we, the effectiveness? You know, the issue is about um, enforcement here. You know, we're not going to change anything about someone just crossing the line and engaging in buying these things. The second thing is, is that, you know, this would also cripple, you know, um, um, you know, the folks that do engage that walk to communities and look, adults are gonna be adults and adults have ad adult choices. You know, so, you know, what are we trying to do here? It, you know, so for me and what I've heard from folks is that this is a state policy and that the state needs to decide on this. And I would agree with that. The second thing is the interesting piece that I found of the most distinctive is that the proponents who are for this resolution actually wanted um, some some folks who are lobbyists who are proponents for this resolution actually don't want it as well because they feel that it would thwart and let me just I'm not saying it right thwart T H W A R T thwart the statewide efforts um, that they're doing on that piece. So for me, those things rang loud and clear. So I would. Um, ruling majority leader not being here. The other thing too is that this also came up next last year and the same thing from the lobbyists wanting it to go to the state and making a state issue. So I'm hearing both opponents and proponents not wanting this passed um, from the lobbying movement. So I would make a motion to actually withdraw this item and, um, and throw that out there on the table. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, as one of the proponents of it, I'm not prepared to withdraw it tonight. Um, in fact, I don't even know if I could withdraw it tonight. I think that might be something that has to happen at a council meeting. Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, I, I, I'm not prepared to, 
to go down that road. I, I do want to, I do want to just make make it clear to everyone that the the because I was a, uh, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, but I was a co-sponsor with Councilman Clark of a similar measure, different but similar. Uh, we did submit a measure uh, that was really aimed at banning flavored vaping products. And, and in that measure, we, we, we took the language from the American Heart Association, again, working with them. Um, they had helped draft the proposed ordinance, but uh, Councilman Clark and I very carefully went into the definitions there and made it clear that the definitions um, as, it re as it applied in that ordinance would not have affected menthol cigarettes and would not have affected flavored pipe and cigar uh, tobaccos. That was, the, that was the ordinance that we were looking at previously. We withdrew that ordinance and really we withdrew that ordinance at the request, again, at the request of the, um, uh, of the American Heart Association. They asked us to withdraw it at that time. We came back this time, and I just want to make, make sure everyone understands that, at least my motivation, when I came back this time, this particular ordinance does not take an exception for menthol. It does not take an exception for flavored pipe and, uh, and cigar tobaccos. Uh, and mind you, I've been known to smoke a flavored cigar from time to time, but I'm perfectly content to um, uh, have them uh, you know, not be available for sale. But the biggest single determining factor for me, the biggest single determining factor, and I really want this to be very clear, was the National NAACP. It's the National NAACP which has taken a very strong position against the sale of menthol cigarettes. It's not, you know, it's not particularly something I have a, 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 you know, a stake in other than to promote good policy uh, and to promote, you know, policy that, that best serves the, the health, safety, and welfare of our community. And in this particular case, I'm really taking the lead from the national NAACP. Uh, and that was the single determining factor. And I think that may be the same for Councilman Clark. I don't know, uh, but, but that's what, is kind of underlying this. All that said, um, uh, you know, as I indicated earlier, I'm sort of prepared to just postpone this at this committee. We, who knows what we'll end up doing at the next council meeting with it. Thank you, Councilman Gill. Um, so I also want to welcome uh, Councilwoman uh, uh, Will Delise Bermudez and Councilwoman Shirley Surgeon. Thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate you attending. Um, um, so with that being said, in, in lieu of um, Council Miguel and Majority Leader Clark not being here to withdraw, um, and based upon everything that I said earlier, I vote to vote this back to Council just because it's causing too much, um, you know, um, the more that it lingers, the more that it's causing, I'm using this word consternation, but um, I'm sure there's probably a better word, but I vote to, uh, 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 without a favorable recommendation back to Council. There's a motion on the floor to vote it back without a favorable recommendation. And second. Are you are you a voting okay. member? Did you say? Oh no, you're right. This is no. <laughs> oh, I was. I was. That, that's okay. I, I just got confused for a minute. I forgot where I was. Um, <laughs> not not hearing a second for your motion. I, no, I'm, make... I'm going to make a second. I just was listening to <laughs> Councilman LeBron, and then I heard Councilman Bermuda. So there is a motion on the floor for a, a unfavorable recommendation, and I second that motion. Uh, any discussion? So we have a motion on the floor that's been seconded. Any discussion? I want to allow for Councilwoman Bermudez, Councilwoman Serge, Councilwoman Bermudez, I think you want to discuss. Yeah, did you say, 
Unfavorable or favorable? I couldn't hear. Uh, I couldn't unfavorable. Hear. Unfavorable recommendation. Unfavorable. Okay, yes. so now things have changed. Okay. All right. All right. So, Council Member Bermudez, I do want to, even though you're not a voting member, you still allow, I mean, at least in, on the committee to, to have a discussion you'd like to discuss. Yeah, I guess, you know, this issue has come up for a long time. And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of baffled as to, you know, why it was sent then back to committee. It's, it's kind of been like a seesaw. I went back to committee and then, went, and then, um, and it seemed like there were, based on my last count, there was enough support for it. There was an immense testimony from the community. Um, and by the community, I'm referring to Hartford residents um, who were in support. And so I'm, I'm kind of confused as to um, why now, and I, again, I'm not a committee member because it's not the committee, this is not the committee that I'm part of, but I'm kind of confused as to why it's unfavorable. Uh, so um, I had spoke at length and without repeating myself, some of the major items were, um, so for me, the biggest thing is that this is a statewide issue and proponents on both uh, both sides of the lobbying aisle. Um, interestingly enough, both proponents that you would consider um, for this, that would be for this, actually don't want it because it's going to, again, thwart their efforts at the statewide level, thwart being T-H-W-A-R-T. And so that was the primary reason, but I gave, of course, a passionate and, you know, um, you know, um, elongated uh, response as to why so um, but thank you for making comments um, so with that being said we have a motion on the floor that's been seconded uh, not in favor of uh, uh, ordinance number two uh, which is uh, ordinance amending chapter 17 article 4a section 102 um, of the Hartford Municipal Code otherwise um, known in the community as tobacco um, we have a motion that's been seconded uh, with discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, let the record show that uh, both uh, Councilwoman Rossetti and myself voted aye. All opposed? Nay. Nay. Uh, let the record show that Councilman John Gale um, uh, voted against this. Uh, thank you all for discussions and thank you, John Gale, um, for um, for um, giving um, your sentiments on uh, number two. The, all right, so we'll move forward. Um, seeing that we do not have um, uh, anyone here to talk about the annual report submitted on the Advisory Commission on Food Policy, um, I'll make a motion to postpone this item. And is, is there anyone here to talk about the food policy? With that being said, I'll make a motion to postpone this item. Um, any seconds? Second. We have a, a motion to postpone this item with a second. Um, all, uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, let the record show uh, unanimous uh, uh, myself, uh, well, Councilman Rossetti, Councilman Gale, and myself uh, voting uh, to postpone this item. All right, so with that being said, we'll move to uh, item resolution number six, which is uh, requesting uh, this uh, resolution was introduced by uh, Councilman Rossetti and supported by, it looks like, the entire council, and it's a resolution uh, requesting that the mayor of Hartford, the Hartford Health Department, local government officials, state legislators, and Capital Region Council of Government take the lead and can collectively dig out the root causes of homelessness and work systematically to put in place a process for all 169 cities and towns to actively contribute and participate in an issue that affects us all. So with that being said, we have uh, Councilwoman Rossetti who introduced the item. The floor is yours, Councilwoman Rossetti. Thank you. Thank you for you, Mr. Chair. So. Uh, certainly, uh, all of my colleagues, and I appreciate their support, are, you know, we address this and talk about it often. Um, my line of work, um, as someone who works at a homeless facility, I really am, you know, ingrained in the work. 
this came out of particularly in the last year, but also what I've watched just in general for the last 10 years doing this work. Um, we're often as a city criticized for how much we get from the state, what we get from others, what we don't do well. And I think, and, and we talk often about, you know, regionalism and what would be a great regional project. And if we could look at things in a regional way in a state that's the size that it is with 169 different towns, which, you know, is just unbelievable. And what I've really come to think is that uh, homelessness could be the start. You know, we, we could really look at that. We know that, and, and it said it in the resolution, and I, I know it for a fact, too, that, you know, well over 40% of the people probably presently where I work are not originally from Hartford and, and for are from other towns in the state of Connecticut and other states in the United States. But we, we, you know, someone said to me once, well, wh wh what, do you, what do you do in Hartford anyway? And I said, you know what? We house the homeless. We, we do social services well. And I'm proud of that work. But when we're criticized and when we're looked at for why we get extra funding, and I know for a fact, you know, all of you here will have heard these urban myths, you know, oh, they drop people off, you know, other towns bring them or police officers drop them off. Guess what? Those are not urban myths. Those are truths. Those are facts. They bring people from other towns to our city because for whatever reason, let, let, let me be, let me be nice about it. They don't have the facility or they, you know, they don't have the patience or they don't, they don't want to do it. But you know what? You know, this is a real simplistic look at it. And that's why I'd like to take some time with what we've said in this resolution and dig a little deeper. I don't want to you know, build another commission or, you know, any of that kind of thing. But think about it for a minute. Think about it for a minute. If all 169 towns took some responsibility on this issue, and maybe it's done in rings. You know, I'm not saying maybe a, a small town, and I, I shouldn't pick one because I, I won't know how small. Um, is Shelton a small town? It sounds small. <laughs> I don't know. You know, a small town is, or, you know, Goshen. Is it a small town? It sounds small. Yeah, that's a but, small town. Okay, all right. But but if they, you know, let's look at it systematically. If if they took some ownership on an issue that not only is happening, but growing, it's growing. And I'm not just talking about the community I work with, men experiencing homelessness. Let's talk about families. Let's talk about children. Let's talk about women. We owe it to the people in this state and this country to find a way to have them decently housed, rehoused, held while we're trying to do that. And it's not a simple thing. You know, I have people in my work, particularly, you know, I don't want to fit against people, but, you know, there's providers, the work we do, and then there's advocacy people. And, you know, never the twain shall meet. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, policy is written without the people who actually do the work. And, you know, when people say to you sometimes, oh, you can house somebody in 30 days. You know, oftentimes people did come to us because they've had multiple issues or they haven't had time to reclaim their lives so when they are housed they're on a better path so here is an opportunity and and am i you know i'm not overly confident that all of a sudden somebody in shelton and goshen i'm just picking those towns <laughs> is going to say oh my god we should work on this we we should all 169 towns should get behind this but can you imagine if we start to look at it in a systematic way in that way you know that some of these towns house five people or or you know and then we can go down that rabbit hole of you know the whole housing piece that's a whole separate thing but there's we as a country as a state as uh you know all these towns we owe a responsibility and for people who talk about what does hartford do to deserve what we get it's what we do so you know what here's a chance for you to step up so i would like to find a way that we um and you know councilman gail and i had talked about this i've talked about it with uh you know the chair here so it's just i wanted to start the conversation i want to start this conversation i don't want to stop the conversation I want to continue the conversation, and I'm not exactly sure how we will continue it, but I think it's a conversation that needs to keep being talked about and keeps needing to be continued, and that's kind of where it started. So 
all, with that being said, I'm absolutely in favor. I know we've had discussions on Councilwoman Rosetti, so I absolutely, you know, double click on everything that you uh, that you stated here today. Um, so my question is, how do you want to approach this? Do you want, I mean, uh, what is it that you want? Do you want to uh, keep it here so that we can continue the conversation and bring some other folks in and come back or, well, you know. Yeah. Maybe my colleagues can help us figure this out. There are many learned people right here, much wiser than myself. Uh, any uh, Anybody would like to discuss? Uh, so first of all, let me uh, back up a little bit and welcome uh, Majority Leader uh, TJ Clark. Thank you, uh, Majority Leader Clark, who's also a voting member here. Um, the floor is open. I don't know who had the hand up first. Majority Leader, since you're, you just came, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, my apologies for my tardiness. Uh, I think um, one of the ways that we can continue to have this conversation uh, would be uh, having uh, something standing on the on the agenda. I do know um, the uh, the previous chair, uh, your predecessor, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, had a uh, either a work group or a standing a standing committee or standing item on the agenda. Where uh, he uh, was talking about uh, homelessness and how to how to address it. I actually think that he actually had a homelessness work work group uh, that he convened on a uh, monthly basis or whenever it was he, he deemed necessary. Uh, so uh, with with all these things that are affecting uh, this population, and you know, kudos to uh, our colleague uh, Councilwoman Rossetti for having the heart and passion. Uh, to, to tackle these issues. I think that's something in my suggestion that, you know, uh, that this committee could actually uh, begin to take up on a consistent basis. Uh, Councilman Gale. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and let me second uh, Majority Leader's comments on the on the passion uh, of uh, Councilwoman Rossetti. Uh, and we thank her for everything that she does and, and all the good work uh, that her organization does, um, but it, it, you know, she's absolutely right. I mean, this is not a Hartford problem. This is a state of Connecticut problem. Uh, so one of the suggestions that I would throw out there is for this committee to consider keeping this on our agenda to the next meeting and reaching out between now and then and asking Krog to come to the next meeting and to tell us, A, what they may have been doing, B, whether they could do anything, they may very well say, um, and I almost would expect them to say that that's out of our jurisdiction. Well, that might be a great thing for us to know and then to follow up by saying, well, how do we get it into your jurisdiction? And, and then maybe the next meeting we ask some of our legislative delegation to come in um, and taking what we've learned from Krog, we might be able to um, address the legislative delegation and say, can you help us, you know, make this happen? Now, that's just one scenario. There could be a million scenarios, but um, it's, it's a way to keep the conversation going and to let people know that we're, you know, we're thinking about it. It's, it's a serious issue. Um, it's, you know, I mean, like so many things that affect Hartford, it's a serious equity issue. Uh, and uh, they, don't, they, they don't seem to go away when we don't talk about them. So uh, there doesn't seem to be anything to lose by talking about them. You, you at least bring them into people's uh, consciousness and, and, and make, make people think about it. So anyway, that would be my, my uh, uh, suggestion at this time. Also in Bermudas, I believe you unmuted yourself so you can speak. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I think all those ideas are that are, have already been brought up are very important. And the thing that really stands out for me with this is the sentence that says, work systematically to put in place a process for all 169 towns, cities and towns to actively contribute and participate in an issue, right? So. In order for us to really get to that root of it, of the 169 towns that we have in Connecticut, I would love to see what if, and we, we know it's gonna be limited, right? Like the answer is 
probably nothing in terms of at the state level, but would love to see like, what is it that ha that they already have maybe some kind of task force, some kind of group at the state level that is addressing that component of like saying, hey, all the towns are in this together because it's not just Hartford's problem. It's not just New Haven's problem. Like every single town is in that has to be in this together. And I would love to so I don't even I don't even know what committee or or who would be take who is already taking that up, but I think that's that would elicit really good research. Um, and, I, and I think to to that point, council councilwoman, there you know there are, are uh, coordinated access networks throughout the state, but you know as well as I do, the unfortunate part is it's the people who do the work, not the people who we want to be a part of those 169 towns and those coordinated access networks that work on the homelessness issue aren't all the towns. There are a lot of them are, you know, the New Haven area, the Bridgeport area, the Hartford area, the urban areas where we're bearing the brunt where, you know, it could be another town. So I think there could be some advice from those groups, but I think the groups that we want are the people that we don't have at the table yet of those, you know, Shelton, Goshen. I don't know why I'm picking on those towns, but they're stuck in my mind. <laughs> So, um, but I, I love I the just, Prague idea, John, uh, Councilman Gale. So, uh, so, so do I. And so I think, um, so here's, here's my thoughts on this item. I think that, um, it's something that, um, the will of this uh, committee and the folks that have joined us today is something that we want to dive deeper on. And there's probably, you know, multiple pathways. I definitely like the ideas of what everyone else said, but in order to make an impact, I think, you know, the other thing that um, I know my council colleagues will probably laugh at me but, uh, because I say this often, and that's system, right? There's a systematic approach that we can take and um, understanding the system and then maybe coming out of it, like diving into the system and processes and maybe coming out of it on the better end as to how to make this a shared responsibility. And I think that maybe we may be on to something um, in terms of shared responsibility across the state. Um, and I think, uh, Councilman Rosetti, I think it's a brilliant idea and thank you, uh, for bringing it forward. So do we have any kind of motion, um, uh, from the floor? Mm. Well, I, I'll follow up with my suggestion and move that we, you know, keep this on this agenda, uh, postpone it to the next meeting and, uh, throw it in your lap, Mr. Chairman, direct the chair, reach out to Prague. Uh, to ask that uh, some representative of CROG uh, come next month and uh, talk to us about um, uh, efforts CROG may have made or reasons why CROG uh, could not be involved or has not been involved. So, uh, what was that motion then, Councilman Gale? I mean, to postpone it to the next committee. To meeting. postpone it. All right, so we have a motion to postpone with some recommend recommendations that uh, folks will see in the uh, Health and Human Service Committee report as to why we're postponing. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, second it uh, by uh, Majority Leader Clark. I just both at the same time. All right. Uh, any discussion? All, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, so moved. Uh, let the record show that um, unanimously we voted uh, to postpone. Uh, this item, uh, item number six. So we'll move on to other business. Um, and as we know, we are still in the thralls. I'm using a lot of TH words today. Thralls of the pandemic, THR. We don't want to, uh, Chair, yes. Mr. Chair, we don't want to thwart your thralls. I don't know. It's just, I don't know. I'm on a TH wave today. Um, but um, with that being said, you've, 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 you've thrice brought it up. <laughs> so we're going to throw the ball back at you. Exactly. You're being so thorough. <laughs> Thursday. So, <laughs> so um, thank you so uh, thank you so much for um, entertaining me, guys. The um, so with that being said, we have Director Arroyo. We are in the midst of pandemic and we're transitioning to vaccine. We have a whole lot of COVID stuff, and she's always so thorough in providing uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, coronavirus updates and or vaccines. So with that being said, on the other business item, uh, Director Arroyo, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Sorry, I was trying to figure out where how I unmuted myself. It's been a while since I've been on WebEx. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Just wanted to give um, some quick updates on COVID and where things are at. So I think as you're all very much aware, our numbers across the state and across the country have been trending down. The same is true uh, here in the city of Hartford. Our numbers continue to go down um, and our test positivity also continues to go down. Um, you know, some things that we're seeing um, overall are, um, you know, less, less individuals um, becoming infected, uh, less individuals uh, that are getting tested, testing positive, which is all really great news. And so I think you all know um, schools have uh, reopened fully five days a week for the younger for the younger folks at this point in time, which is great news. Um, our numbers at this point in time are lower than we were when we made the recommendation to, when, that, when our department made the recommendation to go to hybrid to the school system. So we're glad that numbers have come down and that they're able to be back in, in school buildings uh, starting today. Um, overall, in terms of vaccine, I know there's been a lot of news about um, where the cities are and how they rank. I think all of us knew that vaccinating uh, was going to be a challenge for lots of reasons. I think part of the, you know, lots of talk about vaccine hesitancy. Um, I like to call it vac uh, not vaccine hesitancy, but more a lack of information. Uh, that is something that is and has been an issue as it relates to reaching different communities for decades. Uh, I've been doing this work nearly 21 years now and transportation, technology, language, information are all issues that have always been there when we're looking at communities of color. And so we wouldn't expect that vaccine distribution for something like this would be any different. Uh, here at the city of Hartford, we have taken that on, that challenge and those challenges head on. We provide transportation to our uh, seniors who do not have access to a vehicle or access to a ride to any uh, vaccine site here in the city of Hartford. We made signing up for a vaccine very easy. We do not require you to have an email. We do not require you to go through BAMs. You can give us a phone call. Um, system's not perfect. Sometimes it takes us a couple of days to get back to you, but we are getting back to people. Um, we are calling people through Saturday mornings, just so that everyone's aware. So during the daytime here, but also through Saturday mornings as well, returning phone calls to, um, to individuals who have called us um, as well as uh, doing outbound calls to individuals from our rental rebate list, our voter registration list, and our senior center list. So not only are we uh, taking in phone calls and doing appointments that way, we're also doing the proactive outbound phone calls to schedule seniors. So that's something that um, we're very happy and, are pr and pride ourselves on being able to do for our residents. And so um, the other thing, as you all know, is to sign up a senior or sign up uh, not necessarily now a senior at 55 years old, but sign up a person a program where if you know someone who may not be able to use technology or um, you want to help someone sign up for a vaccine appointment, you can fill out a very basic form and then we would also call them and make an outbound call. We have seen um, residents from other municipalities calling us uh, directly and also using that phone that phone line, um, that sign up form as well. And so our work has always been focused on ensuring first that our Hartford residents have access to the appointment slots that we have. And then if we have leftover appointment slots, we definitely will schedule individuals from other communities. We do see um, some interest from uh, Spanish speakers as well from other communities because we do have Spanish speaking staff here at the health department who are able to assist them um, in language. So that's pretty much what we've been doing the past couple of weeks. Uh, all told, we have done over 2,000 vaccinations as the city health department. Uh, our numbers, uh, we face some, some data challenges in terms of working with this new system that we're all learning, VAMS, uh, Vaccine Administration Management System from the state. So um, we've had some reporting challenges there, but we continue to work through those and move through that um, relatively quickly as we identify new solutions um, and double down on uh, ensuring that we're getting all of our data in in a timely manner. But other than that, we've, we have found a lot of great success with our Dunkin' Donuts Park vaccination site. We get a lot of individuals telling us that they're pleased with the service that they're receiving there. We did have one week that was a little rough. That was the week of uh, the long weekend where even though we didn't have 
the full complement of staff that we would normally want to run a clinic, we chose to move forward. We thought it was important to keep going. And so um, we made changes based on feedback. And so we had a very nice, smoothly running um, situation in full this last week. So if you were low risk, you were pretty much out in about 30 minutes. So from the time that you got there, you checked in, you got back your vaccine and you waited your 15 minutes. Um, in most cases, it was about just 30 minutes in and out. So that was great. And that was a, a nice change that we've made to the system there. So I'll stop there, um, see if there's any questions. But, uh, you know, we're partnering with everyone in the city for outreach. Um, we're doing door knocking. We went out last week. We'll continue to do door knocking this week as well. We're trying to be very, very, very proactive to schedule our individual, schedule individual, individuals and community and then move forward with um, some communications campaigns uh, campaign that we've been working on and getting that out now that we know that there's more widespread access to the vaccine. Thank you for <laughs> leading the effort. Do we have any comments from my colleagues? Uh, Councilwoman Rosani? I don't want to sound repetitive, but Director Arroyo, I, you know, I continue to thank you. I think of our meeting probably a year ago now in March, our last meeting in council chambers, it was health and human services. And I remember you saying, just don't panic. Little did we know what was ahead of us, but you, even at that time, you were, you were a source of, you know, reassurance, confidence. I mean, little did you know what was ahead for you. Um, and those days that just, so again, speaking personally from, you know, the work that I do, we would not have survived without your help. We were able to stay housed, house over a hundred men safely in a way that, you know, without your help, we wouldn't have been able to do it. And then just, you know, just duplicate it across the city. And I, I do want to say, I don't want to talk publicly that my husband's technically, well, technologically challenged, but I did sign him up today. So I'll just say that. <laughs> so, thank you, Director Arroyo. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have Andrew, a great team Andrew here. Staff, Andrew staff. I was gonna say, we have a great team here. Uh, we have lots of people doing a lot of great work. So I'm very, really, um, really lucky to have the team that I have here at the city. Thank you. Uh, any other, uh, any other, my colleagues want to, uh, Councilman Gough? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Director Arroyo. Uh, I, I, I will say, as someone who has a lot of gray hair, I, I have a lot of friends that also have gray hair, and uh, I can report that uh, many of my uh, friends uh, in the city have been called by the city. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they were very, let me tell you, they were very impressed. People called me and said, hey, I, I just got a call from the city telling me I could go get my, uh, go get my shot. So, um, you know, so that's working. That, that, that's working and, and, you know, citizens, are paying attention, residents are paying attention and, and uh, appreciative of the efforts that the, the city's made. I do have one uh, question. Um, I have personally, I'm a, and uh, you may know my wife's a school nurse. She's been very involved with, with this as well. And uh, we've, we, you know, tried to do our part to make sure that everybody we know knows how to get access to vaccines. We've sent a lot of people over uh, to Dunkin' Donuts uh, for that, and to uh, both St. Francis, Hartford Hospital, et cetera. But speaking particularly about the uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts effort, one of the things that um, has been a little frustrating is that people don't get their follow-up appointment, or they haven't been getting their follow-up appointment when they go and get their first shot. And I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, why that is or if it's changing or uh, because I can tell you that what's happened is people have called us being frustrated. They trying to get their second appointment. They call 311 and they don't get through or they, they leave a message. And you know how people are. I mean, I, I'm sure you get back to them, but if you get back to them in three days and they wanted it back two days, they're, they're frustrated. Anyway, uh, what, what, are you, what can you tell us? So we've made adjustments in the last two weeks. So that was only for the first two weeks. And we've done four at Duncan. Two, uh, we were sort of learning a new system and trying to figure out a new system there. Uh, and now that we figured it out, the third week of um, 
vaccinations there, people are getting their appointments on site. Same thing this past week. So people are getting their appointments now um, on site. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we get phone calls, we have them on our list and we're like, I never got an appointment. We're like, well, we have you down for this date. People lose their papers. It happens. But if you call us, we'll get back to you. We are um, actively calling all of those individuals from the first two um, vaccination, uh, vaccination days at Duncan to get them scheduled and get them in. So that has been ongoing um, last week. And this week I was with my team. They were making those phone calls and working with 311 to also make those phone calls. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, Councilwoman Ramirez? Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo the same uh, sentiment that was mentioned by my colleagues, but you've been doing an amazing, phenomenal job. So on behalf of everybody in the city of Hartford, we, we thank you for your entire effort and work and all that you do. So I wanted just to say that and then uh, the other part was the question for those who are watching, just if you could repeat um, how people can access um, being able to make the appointment, the sure. phone numbers and all that. Sure. So um, there's a couple ways. First, if you can go, you go to hartfordct.gov, there's that very simple sign up sheet. It's like a very Google Doc type documents. Um, you can just put your name, birthday, uh, phone number, and you'll get a phone, an email. If you have an email where, if you have an email that you want to share, we can email you your appointment, or we can call you and, and schedule an appointment. So that's again on HartfordCT.gov. You can call the health department directly, and again, um, you know we do aim between 24 to 48 hours. I will tell you for sure. Every Saturday morning, it is completely cleared out. And by the time we get in on Monday morning, it's it's full again. But we are aiming for 24 to 48 hours during the work week to um, to uh, to get that information out. And that phone number is 860-757-4830. Uh, That's 860-757-4830. Uh, we are working and have been working with MHIS to add more capacity there. So it's a rollover line so you don't get a busy signal. Um, and they've been really great. MHIS and working with us increasing the mailbox, but then also doing rollovers. On any given day, we have uh, two to four people uh, actively entering calls all day. It can go up to as many as six to eight people uh, returning phone calls and answering calls as well, just so that folks are aware it is a um, rather large team of individuals, there you go, right on the website, um, that are calling uh, here. And then uh, we are also working with 211, the Appointments Plus number. So if you just uh, call 211, you can call 211 directly. They will connect you to Appointments Plus. We provide them with a number of our um, appointment slots for Duncan uh, by Tuesday for them to be able to start scheduling for us. So uh, those are the different ways that you can schedule an appointment at the city of Hartford. We don't put um, many of our appointments on VAMS. We do put a small number of our appointments on VAMS. So that's also if you are technology savvy and can get on VAMS and can ha and have an email address, you can see for uh, our appointment slots for, the, for there uh, as well. But again, we don't put very many on there because when you do put them on VAMS, what we have noticed is that they do get taken up by our suburban neighbors and then it limits how many people we can serve in the city of Hartford. Uh, we cannot only serve individuals in the city of Hartford. We do have to serve a greater um, a greater area because it's a federal asset. We can't just say we're only going to use it for Hartford. But what we do what we do is prioritize Hartford residents in this effort in the work that we're doing. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Um, I'm one of your greatest fans, uh, Director Arroyo. Uh, you've been doing such a phenomenal job, and um, thank you for all that you continue to do. And uh, you know, um, we just need to get um, more educational pieces out to the community. So um, we'd like to talk with you about some strategy uh, regarding that, how we can do that. Uh, to because one of the things I would like to see is us for us to have the hysteria diminished and just be able to provide folks with you know the pieces for them to make a well informed decision. 
Uh, but uh, kudos to your team uh, and to the partnerships that you have formed uh, regarding, in addition to COVID-19 testing, now vac vaccinations. And, um, you know, whatever resources that you need from us, please don't hesitate to contact us so we can uh, be fully supportive of your efforts. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, we do have the the resources for the communications campaign. Now is a good time to to get that um, finished and, and out because we know that the rollout has changed. I think we would have been premature almost if we had gone out last week as I had hoped initially um, because our information wouldn't necessarily in terms of how to roll out would be going, wouldn't have been correct. So now that we have uh, a plan from the governor of how he's going to roll out, it makes communicating that easier. Um, you know, I also wanted to note that we have been actively going to senior uh, living facilities and vaccinating on site as well. So uh, we have done quite a few, I think we've done four or five already. Some of the larger ones had already been done by CVS or Walgreens. So uh, that was a good thing. They went in and got some of those larger facilities done, but we've done Tuscan, we've done Underwood. Um, we have done Casa de Oro, I believe. Um, we are scheduled to go to Smith Tower. We're gonna be at Sana and Faith this Thursday. So we've been going out to a lot of these places and you know, to your, to your remarks, Councilman Clark, uh, our seniors uh, are gung-ho, they sign up and then they're reading things on Facebook or they're hearing things from friends and then they sort of get a little frightened when we get there. So we're gonna try something a little different before we uh, get there on Thursday, we're gonna work with them and look to send out a, uh, a community health worker with a nurse, with one of our nurses to answer questions before. So do sort of these smaller sessions of education so that individuals, if they have questions, can have them answered uh, and be ready to be vaccinated when we get there on site on Thursday. So that's something different that we're gonna be trying to do. And then the same thing as well with the door knocking. We wanna knock on doors with our CHWs. We're also partnering with the American Red Cross who has a team of volunteers that is willing to work with us. And so they'll be joining us this week on door knocking. And in those instances where we have a CHW with a Red Cross volunteer with the materials, um, we will also be able to schedule on site as well. So if we knock on someone's door and they're eligible and they hadn't called us or we hadn't called them, it's just starting to call some of the younger people now, um, we're able to schedule them right then and there so they don't even have to call us. So as we do that door knocking, that'll be something that we will be um, implementing as well. All right, any other questions from the colleagues? So direct, uh, yes, Councilman Gill. I, not not a question, but uh, another comment. Um, I, I I do you know we're giving the director a lot of uh, a lot of kudos, but I don't want to miss a, the the opportunity to point out that one of our own uh, majority leader Clark has spent the entire winter outside, and and we have seen him in countless meetings with his with his mittens and on and his hat on. And participating in government while at the same time helping this community stay safe and protecting. So, to you, Councilman Clark, thank you for everything that you have done as well, sir. I will most definitely uh, echo that. Uh, Councilman Clark has been a wonderful partner with Charter Oak to the Health Department. Um, when we asked to uh, do testing on school properties, they immediately raised their hand and they continue to do it. So uh, it's, it's one of the great things that I uh, will say. One of the one of the good things that came out of this pandemic, I believe, is uh, we were able to show how quickly government can come together um, and marshal its uh, its resources to get the job done. But then also how quickly here in Hartford, uh, different groups can come together that might not have worked together previously can come together easily and quickly to do the right thing for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't think they were mittens. I think they were gloves, right? I th yeah, they were, they were. They weren't mittens, right? Majority leader, they were gloves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I do have a couple questions, Director. I don't want to hold you for too much longer. So I was at a meeting on Saturday uh, where um, there were some concerns about outreach and marketing towards the Latino um, population. And I know you just talked about marketing, but can you just give us a you know a brief update? Like, what is the plan? Uh, for the Latino uh, community um, in terms of, you know, what uh, what levers are we going to push for the marketing sure. communication piece? 
Sure. So um, as part of the door knocking that we did, we are going by census block. So we've identified blocks um, initially that were 50, 75 and up, 65 and up, and now 55 and up. So we've identified not census tracts, but actual smaller identified blocks. And uh, we are looking at those neighborhoods where we have high numbers of individuals that are 55 and older, and um, we'll be concentrating in those neighborhoods. So last week we did two blocks that had the highest percentage of individuals that were 65 and up. Again, excluding um, excluding the nursing the places that had nursing homes because that would obviously skew the numbers, um, and then just making sure if there were areas that had senior housing, if we had already gone to that senior housing unit, that um, we were keeping that into account and just focusing on the neighborhood, not necessarily the senior housing. Uh, as part of that, they were going up and down Park Street as well. And, and working and providing information to business owners on Park Street. We did the same thing in the North End. We selected two blocks. Um, again, we're gonna increase that capacity with the Red Cross volunteers to do more census blocks. Um, but we uh, did the same thing in the North End and going down part of Albany Avenue, we continue that work. We do have the, the contract uh, with the communications firm. They've been working on some pieces for both English and Spanish, as well as with a diverse uh, number of individuals. I'm not sure if you saw some of the flu work that was done. We had some ads on Facebook um, uh, of doing outreach to Latino and African Americans. And so we had familiar faces in our community uh, talking about why they got the flu shot. So that is also happening for this as well. So we will be doing a big push with paid media to push that out. So we're looking at both radio, TV, as well as social media. So that is forthcoming. And I think the difference for us, rather than saying just get the shot, it's gonna really talk more about the safety and how you can get it and where you can get it and sort of answer some of those questions. So it's uh, from the public health perspective, when you repeat myths, they become true to people. So we don't wanna repeat the myths, but we wanna sort of answer those questions that people have. Does it, you know, if I get the shot, does it mean that I can't get COVID? If I get the shot, does it mean, what does it mean? There are people that have those kinds of questions. So we want to answer that through some uh, proactive outreach and proactive videos that we're doing. So we know that there are sort of different, different phases right now, but we'll be working on getting that out. But that'll be uh, a large part of the outreach. So the door knocking, the direct phone calls to community members from the different lists that we have. We have partnerships with uh, Hispanic Health Council, Family Life, Education, and Hartford Communities That Care. So that sort of covers uh, pretty much most of the city. Um, through our flu work, we had developed a relationship with the Ministerial Health Alliance. We're looking to expand that as well with, um, with additional funding that we're looking at getting. Uh, we should know in about two weeks whether we get that funding. Um, but uh, there will be some uh, other paid opportunities for community groups to get involved as well as uh, faith-based uh, groups as well to get involved with us to be able to do some of that work. Um, I will also say that um, we will be funding, um, we received a, a, a proposal through our open competitive uh, RFP process that we did earlier this year from uh, from Sammy Vega and the, uh, the Puerto Rican Parade Group. So um, they will also be funded to do some work. We funded the West Indian Club as well. So we've been funding different groups around the community with the funding that we've had available. Uh, and we will continue to do that as we continue to get more funding. So it's really a mix of both volunteers paid staff uh, through the CBOs that we're working with, paid staff through the uh, Centers for Disease Control uh, Foundation that are working with us, our staff as well. Um, we'll be hiring some staff um, at the city as well to continue this work through a grant that we received um, and working with volunteers. Thank you. So just one item on the marketing communication piece. Um, one of the uh, folks that uh, spoke to me um, that um, any any idea of Telemundo, they, if they feel like Telemundo is the the bigger, broader bucket when uh, when our seniors are are watching the novelas. Um, I remember my grandma having to sit through it when I was younger, and um, that's just a part of the daily functions. So, any any thoughts on Telemundo? Yes, they will be a part of that. So, like I said, um, radio, TV, as well as social media, absolutely. Thank you. All right, so lastly, um, 
I, I know you have such a, an uh, intimate working with uh, the schools and uh, been a part of you know them phasing back on March 1st. So the question I have for you is in regards to the youth outside of schools, right? Like outside of the school day hours, you know, they've been, you know, during the pandemic had to be in the house, you know, and um, are kind of bursting at the seams for opportunities to engage in some physical activity and being outside. So can you t describe your level of involvement with like the recreation department and uh, Kim Oliver in terms of, you know, what are, how are you partnering with them to roll out, you know, programming um, for the upcoming year, obviously using, you know, the, 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 the shared measures that we all use, social distancing, masks, you know, hand sanitizing, you know, those type of things, but also capitalizing on the amount of space and park to city ratio that we have. So just curious as to, you know, um, your partnership. And I know that question came out the blue. So if you want to come back and answer it next time, but, you know, it's up to you. So we do, I do work closely with uh, Kim and her team. They, uh, they're very well aware of and are very much on top of all of the COVID rules and restrictions that exist that, that are currently in place. And so as things get loosened up at the governor's level um, and they put a plan together, they check in with me, we meet. If necessary, if I have questions, um, I will reach out to them. If once I read their plan, they will reach out to me. So we do work together closely. They, you know, they have their their role. They have what they're putting together. Uh, they share with me. I provide feedback or guidance. They ask me questions. So we do have a great relationship, and we work closely together on these items. Thank you. Uh, so you'll have some um, influence there, obviously, with the safe, with the with the mindset of safety. Um, so um, I just as I just want to put a pin in it, you don't have to discuss it. The community is really desirous of pools this year. I know last year with the rollout, it would have been very difficult and um, and hard to do. But the difficulty going into this year is that everyone last year around us, so there were some towns around us that have, did have pool access. And so, um, you know, just wanted to just put a you know pin in that. I'm sure there's, you know, summer's going to be here and the pools are just such an important part of, you know, they were an important part of my life growing up and um, learning how to swim there and, and just avoiding the heat, beating the heat. But, you know, it's such a viable resource for our community. So just want to put a pin in it. No comment. I know there's a plan, but just uh, the constituents are are um, are really desirous of that for this upcoming year. Um, so with that being said, um, uh, a year ago at this time, I want to just acknowledge everyone on this Health and Human Service Committee. A year ago um, at this day, I don't know if it was March 1st exactly, but we talked about the coronavirus. It had just hit Seattle. Uh, and again, uh, like Councilwoman Ro uh, Woman Rosetti said, that, um, you know, Director Royal came here and told us to not panic. And uh, we all know, you know, the data that we all use of the line of demarcation as March 13th, 2020, as the day where the world changed. And so, you know, I just want to just acknowledge all my committee members and all my colleagues and Director Arroyo for like really being like having foreshadowed this and we discussed it. And, uh, you know, folks can fact check me and look at the notes that we have. But Director Arroyo, you are already putting a, a plan in place. Um, before the country. And uh, and we partnered here and all my committee members were asking questions and we were, you know, Hartford was on, you know, on the forefront of, you know, thinking about how to address this issue before it even became an issue and we've been discussing it ever since. So I want to thank you, your team, Majority Leader Clark for all his efforts, the nonprofit organizations, the entire team and the entire system for we're coming up on a year and we can now see the light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, with that being said, um, I take a motion to adjourn. I'll move. I'll move. Any second? Second. All right. Everyone be safe. Peace out. Good night. Bye. All right. Have a good evening.